Kia good evening. Welcome to Southern Newsweek. I'm Craig Storey. A group of young Queenstown students are raising money for their school with gorgeous results. That story soon. Members of Rotary and the Invercargill business community are coming together to build a house for the homeless. And Cadrona Alpine Resort's new $10 million investment is expected to be in time, ready to go for the coming ski season. Good evening and welcome to Southern Newsweek. A group of young Queenstown students have been working on a very special project to help raise money for their school. St Joseph's Primary School students have had a project hauntingly groovy and terrifyingly funky. Here's Mina Amso with the ghoulish and gory details. At their recent annual book fair in Queenstown, these St Joseph's Primary School pupils managed to scare their audience for a good cause, helping the school raise over $23,000. The South today was invited behind the scenes to look at how they turned a tent into a haunted meeting place. It came from a few years ago. Someone had decided to do a haunted house from the previous year's book fair. And um, so I really wanted to do it because it was pretty amazing. And um, so then uh, we decided to do it this year. Like experienced puppeteers, the team pulled all strings together to make it happen. Well, we have a person in the group whose family works at the Salvation Army. So he got a few props from there, like the mannequin. And our teacher gave us the bed because she had it in her house. So uh, lots of it was from other people letting us borrow it and use it. We worked as a team and never gave up. Proud school principal Trish Inda reckons her students get better at coming up with great ideas year on year. I think uh, for the last few years, I think each year they learn from each other and that came through in the conversation too. You know, the um, Sam was saying about Mary um, started off the uh, what they call it, the ghost house or haunted house, whatever, and then that's morphed and now it was the haunted room and it was each year I think it steps up, so each time it steps up and they learn from each other, which is how learning happens I guess. The girls learned to stare fear in the face and not give in, even when things look pretty intimidating. Mina and so the South today. Crowded into a fruit packing building in Industrial Alexandra on Saturday, nearly 450 people watched a parade of models wearing woolen garments for the 13th annual Wool On Fashion Gala. Wool On Chairwoman Claire Higginson says quality of the competition has greatly improved over the years. In, uh, a while ago we had a big variety in the, the standard of the garments but with more and more competition and people knowing more and more what to what level they need to go to, they, they seem to have lifted their game and lifted their game really awesomely here tonight. On Friday there was a first look night which attracted around 200 people and on Sunday there was an up close and personal showing at the Central Stories Gallery. This weekend's principal sponsor is Rural Woman of New Zealand. Well done. Members of Rotary and the Invercargill business community are coming together to help the homeless by volunteering their time to build a house. The house will be auctioned and the proceeds used to upgrade accommodation for some of the 120 homeless people in Southland. Here is Ruby Spink. Knocking homelessness on the head. Callum Rutledge is one of a group of Invercargill residents doing their bit to solve a national problem. In a partnership between Invercargill's six Rotary Clubs and supported by local business and numerous volunteers, a house is being built in the suburb of Grasmere. The plan is to auction the house to help fund the Southland Breathing Space Trust. Actually, it was about two and a half years ago it all started when I was first approached by uh, one of the Rotary Clubs about a block of land that I've got up here and whether I'll be interested in uh, doing this project as a uh, fundraiser. So yeah, it's been, been a long haul to get to this stage. The Breathing Space Trust provides emergency accommodation for the homeless in Invercargill and the money from the auction will help it increase the number of rooms available at its emergency night shelter. 
uh, we feel it's a worthy cause and uh, you know and they're a good team that works with them so well they're a, a, a trust that uh, help with support to homeless and not only you know for the homeless in Invercargill but they also look you know work with them to help them in there in the process there. No one knows how much money will be raised by the selling of this house once it's completed but Rutledge says the cost has been significantly reduced by the amount of time and materials donated to the project by local people and businesses. Uh, we've had great support from the uh, local businesses and that side of things um, that have come on board not, not only just volunteering their time but uh, Lots of doing it for nothing and uh, sexual businesses and that sort of thing as well. But then there's been a lot of volunteers through the through the ro Rotary and then even people that aren't involved in the Rotary that have turned up. He says the house should be finished by September when it will then be auctioned. I'm Ruby Spink for The South Today. Work to catalogue the collection found in a 30 hectare swamp in the Waitaki River mouth more than 50 years ago began last year and it is expected to take several years and there are 10,000 stone tools, flakes and broken artefacts to sort through from what is now known to be one of the largest archaic Māori settlements in New Zealand. Staff at the North Otago Museum and Professor Richard Walter of the University of Otago's Anthropology Department say that the Willits Collection has great scientific value as a representation of very important New Zealand history, the very first phase of settlement. Professor Walter says that there were other collections from around the country with material from about the same period, but the Willits Collection stands head and shoulders above because of its vastness. The material stems from early Māori settlement and into colonial times. He describes the collection as ornate and exciting, but also says the mundane items also give scientists a greater understanding of how people lived and adapted to their new home. The North Otago Museum says it is incredibly rare for any community to have such direct access to the very first people who settled in the area. The Cadrona Alpine Resort's new $10 million Chondola is expected to be finished very soon. Final checks are underway this week, as the South Today's Kerry Waterworth reports. The Chondola is a cross between a chairlift and a gondola, and although the snow hasn't arrived yet, the Chondola is now almost ready to carry skiers, from the Cadrona Alpine Resort's base building to the top of the field. This is different to any other lift there is on a ski field in New Zealand, uh, with the cabins and the chairs. So that's the main differences for this one, which makes everything slightly more complicated. With a mix of six-seater detachable chairs and eight-person gondola cabins, it can carry 150% more people than the 30-year-old chairlift it replaces. Installing it over the summer had its challenges. Any project on a mountain there's obviously always a lot of difficulties. Uh, we did have a lot more snow than expected through this summer. We sort of anticipated snow on the ground uh, every, every month. We had it on the ground every week. The Chondola will be officially opened on the 10th of June. I'm Kerry Waterworth for The South Today. And Invercargill's not-for-profit group Koha Kai has extended its operations. More on that good story soon. Three men have survived a harrowing ordeal at the hands of Neptune after their fishing boat was stranded on a sandbar in Greymouth. Great pictures from the West Coast. Welcome back to Southern Newsweek. Invercargill's not-for-profit group Koha Kai has extended its operations. The service provides disabled Southlanders a pathway to employment by teaching them food skills. The project is expanding to new operations with more people becoming involved. Invercargill's Koha Kai is teaching adults with disabilities how to grow and cook healthy meals. And today was its first day providing those meals to the students at Te Farekura or Arafenua. It was a practice day to see how the kitchen works, to see how this, because they've never been in this environment before, it's the first time they've been here. So we only served one option on our first practice day. Today that was nachos and we received orders for 128 meals. <laughs> so yes, a little bit more than what they are generally used to. But you know, it's really important for us to get it right and we know that there's a lot of child poverty, we know that there's a lot of hunger and stuff. I mean we had two little cute little girls come in with 40 cents and say, can we please have some? And of course, of course, we're always going to make sure that the children get looked after. 
but um, it is funny um, seeing the little people because it's something quite new to them and they don't know that every meal they have has got like five different vegetables in it. <laughs> She says the not-for-profit group's main purpose is to provide a pathway to employment for people who are isolated from the community. And the group's been rewarded for its efforts, winning the Trust Power National Community Award and receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in donations. The Invercargill Licensing Trust donated $80,000 today to help the group furnish its kitchen at the South Invercargill Community Hub. It was a good fit for the community and uh, Kahakai was it resonated with everybody and uh, it's very seldom that it happens at a board level that everybody agrees instantly. It was just a matter of about uh, how much we could gift to them or grant to them because of uh, our policies and procedures but uh, a really good fit and I think that uh, the $80,000 that we've given them here today is going to be a significant starting block for them. Lee says the kitchen at the community hub will lead to Kōhākai being able to give people qualifications, increasing their opportunities for employment. I'm Ruby Spink for The South Today. Three very lucky men have survived a harrowing ordeal as their fishing boat Kūtere was stranded on a sandbar in Greymouth. Matthew Fisher, no pun intended, and his son Aidan, along with the boat owner Les Horncastle, endured a rough night in the seas as the boat was buffeted in very heavy conditions. The men managed to set off flares and then escape in the fishing boat into a lifeboat in the middle of the night. The Maritime, Museum, uh, Maritime New Zealand spokesman says the 16 and a half metre fishing vessel is still intact and there is no evidence of any oil or fuel being spilled from the boat. Three fishermen are safe and well, and I'm sure very grateful. A 27-year-old Otago apprentice, apprentice builder has taken the top prize in a national building challenge, and here's a good story. There is a shortage of volunteers, especially men, to support Queenstown's Wakatipu Youth Trust. Perhaps you should consider getting involved. And also, Queenstown is to host nine matches of the Cricket World Cup and an international violin competition. Welcome back to Southern Newsweek. An Otago apprentice builder has taken out the top prize in a national building challenge over the weekend. Chris McLean, he's 27 and he bet 14 other competitors from around New Zealand to take out the Ken Reid Memorial Trophy. To win, Mr McLean had to complete a portfolio of his work plus endure a 20 minute interview with the judges. This is Chris McLean's toolkit as it stands today but he's about to move up in the world. Uh, yes, yeah, so I didn't want to spend too long looking at the prizes when I had to carry them around before the competition, and I had no idea that I'd be carrying them home. So, <laughs> so, um, Is that some yeah. of them there in, in the van? Uh, not yet, they're, they're still on their way, so oh. my wife's going to give me a bell when they arrive, and I said, clear the dining table, honey, because uh, we've got to fill her up. The Dunedin Apprentice Builder has taken out the national title at the New Zealand Certified Builders Apprentice Challenge in Auckland after winning the Otago Regional title earlier this year. While his previous challenge was more hands-on, McLean says this round was a bit more like the TV show The Apprentice, but competitors also had time to build a go-kart for fun. He credits his experience making speeches at weddings with helping him prepare to address a room of 150 builders and judges. The greatest honour, he says, was receiving the Ken Reid Trophy, awarded in memory of the builder Ken Reid. He actually went around and trained apprentices and, and picked up getting more apprentices in the trade. And so um, he's a bit of a legend. And um, he actually passed away on the job. His boss, Sasha Gray of Just Build It, says he was worried he might have lost McLean as an employee after he took out the top honour. And I guess in the back of my mind, I always had a feeling like, hey, I think he's got something special. Um, and um, obviously, um, obviously he will be getting a pay rise. <laughs> Sometimes um, there's a perception that people just um, default to the trade. Um, for us, I, I love seeing guys like Chris, and you know, a lot of it is, there's heaps of really good guys in our area that were also at the um, at the regional um, who are actually passionate about the trade, and they want to make a they want to make a living out of it, and they want to make a good living. But McLean has no plans to move on just yet, although he might need a much bigger van for those new tools. Roselle Lebone, The South Today. 
Queenstown's Wakutipu Youth Trust is under pressure to keep up with increasing demand for its very important services, and that's only part of the problem. The Trust is also facing funding issues, a shortage of full-time staff and a lack of volunteers, especially men. Mina Amso reports. Be careful. I know you like your jumps. All right. Queenstown's Wakatipo Youth Trust workers Susan Kelly and Richie Hadlow connect with young people across the Wakatipo Basin, from Glenorchy to Aratown. That includes seven schools. It's a full-on job and they admit to being stretched. You know, whether we like it or not, there's going to be more kids. Wakatipo Youth Trust manager Jackie Muir says there aren't enough hands on deck. Definitely youth workers' time is getting a lot more stretched, so we're definitely more in demand than we've ever been, to, um, particularly in mentoring, that one-to-one -one youth engagement. Currently, the Trust has four full-time youth support workers, one part-time staff member and only one volunteer. We are well and truly ready to employ mm -hmm. another full-time person because we are just really stretched trying to, because we're the only youth trust in this community. Muir has been struggling to recruit more volunteers to help. She made a call for more volunteers two months ago, but says the follow through wasn't great. We've not had it this bad before. And she says there's insufficient funding available for another full-time staff member. What happens is a lot of the um, Places we apply to for grants, they're getting a lot more applications, so the funds that they have to be able to share are being stretched further, which is great because everyone's got these great causes, but it means that our capacity to um, keep our funding at the same level is really, really challenging. Kelly says a shortage of male youth workers is an added pressure. Yes, at the moment we've got three female and two male, and it'd be nice to have another male. I think there's a shortage in male influence across the whole social sector and that comes down to um, the wage basically. The Wakatipo Youth Trust was established in 2011. That came following a merger between the Queenstown Life Trust and the Wakatipo District Youth Trust, both of which had been established in the community for about 10 years. And while youth workers are feeling stretched, they are hopeful the local community will back them up for the difficult days ahead. Mina Amso, The South Today. Queenstown is to host nine matches in next year's Under-19 Cricket World Cup. The matches will be played on the newly renovated Sir John Davies Oval at the Queenstown Event Centre in Frankton. Here is Mina Amso with more on the game. John Davy Oval in Queenstown might be empty now, but for two weeks from January 15th, it will be full of cricket fans and media attending the Under-19 Cricket World Cup. The International Cricket Council Tournament Director Brendan Burke says Queenstown will be the perfect venue. With the Remarkables you know, behind me, it is one of the more scenic um, grounds around the country, absolutely, or around the world. Queenstown will be one of four venues for the tournament, along with Christchurch, Tauranga and Whangarei. We've got um, uh, one of the pools down here for the group stage of the tournament, and then we've got the knockouts as well, so two quarterfinals. And, um, and there's another four playoff matches, so there's going to be, as I say, uh, seven or eight uh, teams down here through the duration of the tournament. Yeah, absolutely. That's going to be the Out of the 16 teams that qualify uh, for the tournament, there is uh, 10 of the Test Play Nations, so all the ones we see the Black Caps normally playing. Um, obviously New Zealand, Australia, South Africa, England, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, uh, Bangladesh, um, to name a few. And then there's uh, the other six that qualify are uh, the five uh, other regions of the ICC around the world and they play qualifying tournaments to, um, to make it here to New Zealand next year and Namibia who finished in the, uh, the highest qualifier from last year's tournament in Bangladesh so they qualify automatically as well. All games will be broadcast live to an international audience and Burke says the tournament will benefit Queenstown hugely. But the direct spend into Queenstown alone from the teams, you know, from accommodation to transport, uh, you know, rental cars, catering, security, medical, um, you know, there's a direct spend there already of about uh, $2 million. The Queenstown Lakes District Council's Sports and Recreational Representative Simon Batrick says the council put in a bid for the event, 
but would not reveal any figures relating to the likely costs to the council. At the moment the figures are unfortunately sensitive, uh, reasonably sensitive as far as commercial um, aspects with New Zealand cricket and, and ICC. The Under-19s Cricket World Cup next year will be the first international cricket event in Queenstown since 2014. Mina Mso of the South today. The 2017 Michael Hill International Violin Competition is in Queenstown in this Queen's Birthday Weekend. Rounds 1 and 2 of the competition are taking place on June 2 to 5 in Queenstown. From there, six semi-finalists will head to Auckland for Round 3, which takes place on June 7th and 8th. The thrilling final event in which the top three violinists, violinists will perform in Auckland's Town Hall with the Auckland Philharmonia Orchestra takes place next Saturday. The 16 performers are currently practicing up to 13 hours a day and some also undertaking physical and mindfulness training, including karate and yoga. And that wraps up this edition of Southern Newsweek. Please be sure to like us on Facebook. We do like your blue thumbs up. Check out our YouTube and our Twitter feed and keep up with Southern News via our website, channel39.co.nz. It's been a pleasure. I'm Craig Storey for Southern Newsweek. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.